Okay, our next speaker <coughs> is going to be talking about Revival Gold Project, an old Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Lemhi County, Idaho. And Teresa Hughes is from Illinois originally in Charlotte, Chalet, Idaho, and uh, did a lot of work in Idaho Cobalt and worked for Jacobs Engineering. And uh, she is a senior, a senior scientist with KC Harvey Environmental in Bozeman. She has 13 years of experience in mine water management research, process engineering consulting, and wastewater treatment plant operations. She has a strong background in developing industrial wastewater management strategies that are designed to achieve maximum performance and achieve regulatory compliance while minimizing energy and material consumption and cost. Recently, Teresa Hughes has, was responsible for developing and implementing an environmental, social, and governance compliance program and a stakeholder engagement program for the Idaho Mining Project currently in construction. Welcome, Teresa Hughes. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I appreciate everyone having interest in this talk. This is my first time attending uh, this conference, so thank you very much to the organizers for uh, allowing me the opportunity to present. Um, I look forward to attending in many, many years to come. Um, so yes, I'll be uh, talking about the Bear Track Arnett Gold Project, uh, building on a positive gold mining legacy. Uh, so just briefly, I'm going to touch on an introduction to the Bear Track Arnett Gold Project, um, give a few examples of how the, uh, at the site there have been some uh, really strong uh, examples of restoration of land and water resources to productive use, and finally going a little bit more broadly into um, how the mining industry in general is aligned with global sustainable development goals all of which uh, come around to this concept of a positive legacy. So, um, so many of you are probably familiar with the Bear Track Mine. Um, just for location here, uh, the project is located in Lemhi County, which is in East Idaho. Um, on the image of the county there, you can see a red rectangle, and then I've zoomed in on that area in the red rectangle. That's the general project area. You can see <clears throat> that figure is oriented north. You can see on the east side, um, there's obviously some extensive development. That is the Bear Track mine site, which I'll be describing to you in a minute. And uh, what Revival is doing is exploring the Bear Track area as well as the Arnett area, uh, which is extending over to the west. Um, this, area, this site is approximately 11, 12 air miles west of the town of Salmon, Idaho. So, <clears throat> back a second. In that small red, red rectangle, I'm not sure if you can make that out, but there's, there's one town named, um, and that is all, all on the Salmon Chalice National Forest, by the way. There's one town named, and it's the town of Leesburg. And... Leesburg was established in around the 1860s. Um, this was one of the first mining camps to be established in Idaho. And it thrived from the 60, 1860s until around the turn of the century. Um, it was primarily uh, placer and load mining was conducted uh, during that period of mining. Then uh, most of the town emptied out, as I said, around 1900. Um, the buildings still remain. It's now on the, the register, uh, historic site. Um, but in the 20s, 1920s through around the 1940s, the area was mined again uh, using a combination of hydraulic mining and some dredge mining. And then activity slowed down again until the Bear Track Mine project was developed. So Bear Track Mine was... Um, <clears throat> As I said, it was the, the first major project to be developed at this site, and it became the largest gold producer in the state. Um, it was an open pit heap leach operations. Um, there were three pits uh, mined in total, and uh, just a little more history there. Um, so I mentioned the town of Leesburg. 
we have three pits, the North Pit, the South Pit, and the Mason-Dixon Pit. So you can put that together. Um, there was a Grantsville as well, but Grantsville for some reason isn't on the map anymore, so <laughs> I haven't been able to find an answer on that one. Um, so it, over the operating life at Bear Track Mine, approximately well, just over 600,000 ounces were produced, and that was during active mining from 1994 to 2000. So at present, the Bear Track Mine is still, um, I, I meant to mention that all of that was um, completed by the operator Meridian Bear Track. So Meridian Bear Track is still operating the site and it is in reclamation phase currently. Um, over on the Arnett side to the west, there have no, been no major modern operations, but there have been, um, much like in the Bear Track area, um, placer and load mining. There's a lot of evidence of historic exploration and uh, various activity, but no major operations and no pits. So Revival Gold has been completing exploration work in the area since 2017. Uh, drilling and metallurgical testing are ongoing still. Um, this year, they're planning to mobilize the drill crews probably later this month, pending weather. Um, for 2022, they're aiming to drill uh, approximately 7,000 meters using uh, core drilling and reverse circ drilling. And this figure on the right shows the primary targets for 2022. And so you can see there in that image, you can kind of see how that overlaps with the uh, historic area that was developed uh, by Meridian Bear Track and then the new sites over to the west. <clears throat> um, at present, Revival is developing what they're calling the first phase, which would be a restart of the heap leach operations. Um, but they are obviously, as exploration continues, they're um, continuously evaluating um, other approaches to developing the site and other processing approaches as well. But for now, um, the PEA, which was released in uh, or filed in December 2020, and then the PFS, which is expected to be completed probably next year, um, are focused on a restart of open pit heap leach operations. So I want to show you a little bit about um, how Bear Track Mine looks currently. Um, this is on the um, north pit, and this image in, this, in the middle is what the site looks like now. Um, it's been backfilled, capped, and revegetated. Um, that was one of the early reclamation uh, phases backfilling the pit and covering and revegetating. Um, in 2006, Meridian Bear Track was awarded the Hard Rock Mineral Environmental Award from BLM for their reclamation success. So fairly early, really, in their reclamation efforts, they, they had already proven out. They, they accomplished a lot of their reclamation plan, and they were doing very well. So they were recognized for that, uh, as I say, fairly early early on in the reclamation program. Um, this is another view of that north pit. And what I wanted to show with this, it's kind of difficult to get a good angle on it, but what this pit really gives a, a great example of is geomorphic reclamation. Um, I'm not even sure they called it geomorphic reclamation in the plan. I think it might have just been that the people who were doing the backfilling and the recontouring knew what they were doing. Um, and it has worked very well. Um, so to simplify this geomorphic reclamation, it's essentially recreating what would be natural contours rather than um, capping and then, you know, just basically flattening out a, a huge slope. And the problem with these long extended slopes with no breaks or changes to aspect or anything like that is that you get soil erosion, it's more difficult to establish vegetation, um, and it isn't natural. So microclimates don't form um, habitats, little pockets for uh, habitats don't form. It's just not a natural um, setting for revegetation and 
um, the basically the the um, restoration of all the other functions that you want your land surface to have. So they've done a great job here. Um, there are some volunteer lodge pole coming in, a volunteer sagebrush as well. Um, and so I wanted to point that out as a, a nice example there. I'll talk about the heap leach pad for a minute. Um, this pad covers an area roughly 120 acres uh, footprint. Approximately 25 million tons of crushed ore residue were placed on the pad. I think at its peak, it's about 175 feet high. Um, the pad has been fully capped and covered. It has a two foot soil cover, a two foot, two foot thick soil cover on both the top deck and the side slopes. It's about a three to one slope. Um, some areas vary, but it's average three to one slope around. And um, there's, these are two angles on it. The first, the larger picture is, was taken when the cover was still being completed. As you can see, uh, you can see that geomembrane <clears throat> is that black on the, that'd be the south corner. Um, and then picture from last year, um, looking back across the heap leach pad from, from the high point, you can see that the, the cover is complete and there's been quite a lot of uh, vegetation has, has taken hold. They're still in the process of revegetating. Um, they're discussing reseeding as was expected. Um, but overall, the, the surface is covered with, with uh, a good grass, you know, a good layer of grass, but it's, they're looking to improve it a little bit. But the cover is working. Um, they, they are still collecting um, drain down. There are seven cells in, in that uh, leach pad, and they're collecting drain down, which does contain cyanide and other metals. Um, they're collecting that in a lined ditch at the toe, and it reports to the water treatment plant. And so all of these facilities that you see in the larger picture, they're actually still intact and still operational. And Meridian uses those to um, primarily for water treatment. Um, that's really their their major um, outstanding reclamation obligation right now is is the wa ongoing management of mine water, and so that water is commingled with some other mine water sources that are being managed at the site, and is charged under an MPDES permit. One more example of the restoration work at the site. Um, the image on the left shows, um, I understand it's kind of, uh, kind of hard to see the details, but um, this is a, a fabulous uh, reclamation, piece of reclamation work. They, um, back in 91, when they were going for their Section 404 permit, they, uh, Meridian and the agencies worked together to develop a, a wetland mitigation plan. And this particular site was, was one aspect of that plan. Um, so the plan included constructed wetlands and enhanced wetlands. And um, this is one of the constructed wetland sites. I'm calling it riparian floodplain because it's really, it, it, the area is a 25 acre area and it encompasses riparian floodplain, upland floodplain, and riverine wetland, but it was all incorporated into the wetland mitigation plan. Anyhow, what they did back in the early 90s was they um, they decided to take this section of stream, which present day is fully vegetated, um, absolutely stunning, full of beaver ponds, full of fish. Um, it's a really thriving section of what Napius Creek is this creek. Um, prior to that, it was essentially um, destroyed. Um, there were uh, historic placer tailings, uh, dredge tailings, um, the cut banks were eroded, there was no floodplain contouring anymore. It was really not, not a healthy section of this creek at all. And I don't think I mentioned this, but this whole area is, um, I did say it was on the Salmon Chalice National Forest, but it's also um, within the Upper Salmon River watershed. and so. It's a it's an area where uh, aquatic habitat is is of primary concern, and now today this is actually a designated critical habitat for bull trout. But it wasn't then. 
um, but they still were very proactive in, um, in the restoration. So they removed about a mile, along a mile section of the creek, they removed um, all of the tailings. Uh, they recontoured and uh, revegetated with broadcast seeding and planting in plugs all the way along, and it's, it's thriving. And so it's just a great example of uh, that. I mean, we hear about that now, but it's nice to think that, you know, it's nice to see examples of mining companies who even before it was maybe, um, you know, before it was understood by the general public that, you know, cleanup is part of the process, mining companies were doing this. And this has had a wonderful impact on the water quality in this, in this particular creek. So at Casey Harvey, <clears throat> we focus a lot of our work on reclamation science. Um, this is really what our company was founded on. Um, we have a lot of different specialists in our, uh, in our organization. As Patrick said, I'm a process engineer. I come from an industrial wastewater treatment background. Um, we have soil scientists. We have geochemists. We have ecologists. We have a lot of different, um, different backgrounds and, and different services that we can support mining clients with. Um, we also do quite a bit of permitting and compliance support more and more, I think, all the time um, for mining, uh, oil and gas, power. Um, so, you know, we're, <clears throat> you know, we're very much involved in reclamation science. We have a strong field crew component. We have a lot of seasonal work for various clients um, going out, implementing, monitoring, reporting, et cetera. Um, but if anyone is uh, looking for any support on reclamation needs or any water treatment um, issues where you might want a, a fresh set of eyes, we'd be happy to help. So <clears throat> a little more about the positive legacy. Um, we say, you know, the, the mining industry, and I don't think anyone in this room is going to be surprised by this, but, you know, the mining industry is um, very tightly regulated in this country by federal law, state level law, local legislation, et cetera. Um, I've got some of the agencies represented here who uh, are responsible for probably the thankless task of enforcing a lot of those laws. Um, but, uh, you know, we, the U.S. really is exceptional in the, in the level of regulation. Um, just as a side, I, I did my uh, university level studies and my research, um, my postgrad research in Ireland. And so I did, you know, I was over there for about 15 years. I did get a good flavor um, for how things, how things function in countries that maybe don't have a super fund or circular program or don't have the same uh, just state capacity to enforce uh, environmental laws. And, you know, it made me appreciate how well we really do get things, we do keep things very, very much in order in this country, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, but beyond the regulatory requirements now, it's, it's absolutely a given that the mining industry um, will need to go above and beyond. And that really is where we come into the environmental, social, and governance, or I say corporate governance, principles. Um, the list on the right is a short list of the uh, various reporting standards that um, miners can follow with their operations. Some of them are more specific. For instance, there's some for gold, um, cyanide management, et cetera. Some of them are more general. A lot of you are probably familiar with GRI and ICMM and SASB. They're kind of more widely widely used across the industry. Um, but along with the regulatory requirements we have, we have this list in the middle, business ethics, health and safety, environmental protection, supply chain requirements, and transparency and accountability, um, which is a, a <clears throat> quite a lot to be not only striving to improve year on year, which is really the expectation of stakeholders, but also to report this um, publicly and voluntarily. And mining industry is doing this, um, and we've you know we've seen some great examples this week already of you know how operators are able to say, look, we've got this track record for the last thirty years. We're continually improving, or you know the, these sorts of things 
everyone appreciates them, but this ESG has kind of brought this information to a point where we're reporting now to a lot of stakeholders, including lenders, including the public. Um, so having said that, Revival Gold is fully aware of these expectations and um, supports the ESG principles with their own work. Um, right now, they're in development or they're in exploration stage, so they don't have a full operating site to report on, but they do have um, a value statement, a mission statement. They're very committed to maintaining environmental quality, but also social connections with the town of Salmon. Um, on the ground, what does this look like? Well, every year they've been holding open house meetings, um, offering uh, public engagement. Um, there's a lot of, in our local paper, I live in Chalice, uh, this project is in Salmon. In our local papers, we see a lot of articles every month almost about what's going on at the project. The project office, the main project office is located in Salmon. The general manager, Pete Blakely, um, is based in Salmon. E VP of Engineering and Development is based in Boise. So I have good you know, presence in Idaho of management. Um, and then they're constantly making an effort and striving to procure and uh, procure supplies and hire local crews for work. Um, more on the environmental side, the uh, <clears throat> as I said, they're they're firm advocates of environmental compliance. Right now, um, you know, the main responsibilities they've had have been reclaiming drill sites, um, drill pads, spur roads, um, that kind of thing. They're working under construction general permit for that, um, along with uh, permission from the Forest Service. And year on year, they get um, excellent reviews back from the local Forest Service team, thanking them for the commitment to concurrent reclamation, et cetera. Um, another thing, and this is an area where Casey Harvey has provided more hands-on support with this for this project. Um, Revival recognized very early in the process that engaging the regulators early, uh, presenting the project plan way before the point of uh, submitting permit applications, um, so describing the project, um, particularly with this being requiring some permits that aren't commonly issued in Idaho, one of those being the cyanidation permit. Um, ongoing engagement with the regulators um, to allow for that regulatory input during the planning stages that's something that Revival wanted to do from the beginning. Casey Harvey's been quite active in uh, facilitating that, um, both with the forest team and then with state level regulators. And then Revival has also started quite early on their environmental baseline work, gearing up towards the eventual NEPA process and EIS. Um, so thank you very much. I think I'm coming down to my time. Um, as I said, Revival is planning to issue their mineral resource estimate update this later this month and a PFS is on the horizon. For more information, you can contact Pete or Hugh. And if anyone would like to speak to me or uh, my boss, Kevin Harvey, who founded the company, uh, we'd be more than happy to help you out with any potential, uh, any potential areas we can back you up on. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>